Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, to be here this evening. I'm delighted to be here. This is uh, this is my spring break from school, so I got to work in a trip to see my brother in Boston and a former student in Portland, and I got to be here uh, also with a fabulous former student from uh, from Friends Central, Erica Carey, who's here. So that's always fun. Um, so tonight we're we're going to talk about uh, having to talk, how to talk about sex. Uh, with your kids at any age. And what I'm going to do tonight is really uh, give information, tell a bunch of stories, and hopefully answer lots of questions. I want to leave a generous amount of time for questions and discussion as we, as we come to the end of our time together. So do feel free, though, at any point, if you have questions or comments, to just raise a hand. But also know there's time at the end dedicated for that. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about me before I start. Uh, a little more than what Ellen said, just so you have a sense of sort of who is this guy and, and what's his agenda and why am I, why am I here. Um, so the first thing I want to be clear about is that I'm your guest. And I'm, I'm very um, happy to be a guest in your home tonight, in your community. Um, and as a guest, I, I feel like I have certain responsibilities. One is to listen. Two is to be re really respectful of of your community, of its values, of your time. Um, so I don't know your community real well, and I'm going to rely on you to help me sort of tailor things to be specific enough for exactly what you want. So that's important to me. Secondly, I'm an educator, and I want to be clear about that. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a therapist, although the, the um, MDI hospital website was very kind. It granted me an MD and an ED. <laughs> Um, which is great, but I don't have either of those. So I have a master's degree in human sexuality, education. So as an educator, what I can bring you is information, and I can teach skills. But I'm not a clinician, and I'm not a therapist, and I don't try to fill those roles. So I won't, I won't try to cross into those lines. Um, I'm also an advocate for positive and healthy sexuality. I, I believe that sexuality is a really good gift from a really good God. And I think it's an, a positive force for good in the world. And it really can be. And that's my orientation towards it. So I don't come with a lot of scary, negative, look out, be afraid. This is about using something that we're gifted with and using it well and valuing it and really prizing it. Um, also in terms of, of positive, healthy sexuality, I'm not afraid to talk about sex. When God was giving out talents, you know, when you're coming down, he gave me two things. Working with teenagers and ease in talking about sex. My friend Liza says, you talk about sex like it's like mowing the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> because it sort of is to me. So I tend to be frank, um, but I promise I won't be gratuitous. So I am going to say a couple of words tonight. That, man, we'll see how it goes. But... <laughs> But I'll try really hard to, uh, to, to meet you where you are and maybe nudge you a little bit. But, but again, to be respectful. I also should tell you that, that I'm not a parent. Um, I'm an uncle. I'm a godfather. I've been parental for, I've helped to parent thousands of kids in my life as a teacher. But I can't speak to you from the perspective of having my own children. And I think that's important for you to know, too. I think that's good news and bad news for us. One is that I come to it from a slightly different perspective. Um, and that can be helpful, but I can never say to you, you know, with my kids, here's what I do. And so I don't, I don't try to presume that role. So those of you who are parents, God bless you. And um, you're really the experts around that. So you'll help me again uh, tailor what we're saying to fit that. Okay. So, Mom, could you answer some questions for me about sexuality and contraception? This is not an uncommon response when our kids come to us uh, to ask us questions. And talking can be hard. And I think that's the first thing we have to acknowledge, that this can be difficult. Um, it's easy for me, but it's not easy for everybody. And I really respect that and know that. Um, and talking can be difficult for a bunch of reasons. One is that we don't know which words we're allowed to use or we should use or which words they know or which words we want them to know. We're going to talk about language tonight. Secondly, it can be difficult because we don't, maybe we don't know the answers. Or maybe we do. 
and we're not sure we want them to know <laughs> that we know the answer. <laughs> and also, and I think lastly, talking about sexuality with our children, no matter what age they are, acknowledges that they are sexual beings. <clears throat> and sometimes that can be hard. But I think it's hard if we come to it with a very limited, narrow view of what sexuality means. And I'm going to try to expand our definition of what it means to be a sexual person tonight to maybe make that a little easier. And maybe even seeing ourselves as sexual beings can be hard. People often say to me, but, but what do I do if my kid asks me about my sex life? Trust me, no kid is going to ask their parents. <laughs> Nobody's going to say, so is that good or what? <laughs> that's, not, that's not a conversation you're going to have. And I would, I would say that's not a conversation you should have. That's a good line. If you're looking for lines, that's it. Okay. Um, so they're not going to ask you that. But they are going to ask you other things. Also, who's talking? One of the things that's important to realize is that the conversation is going on. You may want to jump in or not, but it's happened. Since 1940, the two major sources of information about human sexuality for young people are peers and the media. How does that make you feel? <laughs> you know, two sources that have their value, but may not exactly be the ones we want to be their default. And yet, there are kids... 19.2% might not seem like a lot, but there's documented proof that there's kids out there who want to know what you think and want to hear from you and would rather hear from you than other folks. And I think that's important. I think that's, it's important to have a little confidence that, indeed, um, this is a good thing for, for us to do. This actually has benefits, and indeed it does. We should also recognize, though, let's talk about the benefits of talking. So uh, these stats are, are, are uh, largely for, obviously, for high school kids or, or teenagers, but has benefits for younger kids, too. Parents who talk to their kids about sex, those kids are three times more likely to use condoms, which, if you think that's a good thing, I think that's a good thing. And what we do know is that kids who use condoms at their first act of sexual intercourse are much more likely to regularly use them. So that, that initial moment is really key. Secondly, we know that uh, if parents talk to their kids about sexuality, those kids feel seven times more likely to be able to talk to their partners about HIV and AIDS. As you'll see, one of the things that's my, one of my rules for my students, for any group I talk to, and for me, is that if you can't look your partner in the eye and talk to them about what you want to do, you probably shouldn't be doing it with them. And they're more consistent contraception users. So there's some, there's some good news there. <clears throat> However, there's talking and there's talking. Um, they did a great study where 72% of moms said, yes, I've talked to my kids about risky sexual behaviors. We had really good conversations. And fewer than half of those kids reported that their moms had talked to them about <laughs> risky sexuality and behaviors. So it's clearly something's not happening. We're missing somewhere. And so one of the things I hope we can do tonight is talk about ways to make a better connection. And as you can see, I'll, what's on my PowerPoint is, is already on the handout. So I wanted this to be an evening where you don't have to be scribing. You can really be here and be engaged and be with us. Uh, so here's our, here's our agenda for tonight. I want to talk about what I mean when I say sexuality, and then define what I mean by healthy sexuality and also unhealthy sexuality. I want to talk about the languages of sexuality. There are many different ways we can talk about sexuality. And I think our task is to become multilingual, and we'll see that. And then some very concrete, uh, what's a parent to do? What, what are some good concrete suggestions for having this talk with our kids, no matter how old our kids are? And then again, a generous portion for your questions and discussion. Does that sound okay? Great. Okay, here we go. So sexuality, what does that mean? One of the things I find interesting, oh, here's a, sorry, another cartoon. Do my parents know you're here? Not like that. 
creative puberty look like that? You can actually see it walking through the door. Oh, there it is. Okay. Good. Yeah. Not so much. One of the interesting things is that when you look in uh, college level textbooks, and some high schools as well, for a definition of sexuality, it's very hard to find a good definition for that word. The best I found came from Stanley Snegroff. That's really his name. <laughs> um, and here it is, the integration of biopsychosocial growth and development and how that impacts the individual and his or her relationships. And I put that up on the overhead and my high school students say, what? Is that any what? I don't understand any of that. It's a lot, it's a lot of, and it is, it's a lot of words. The important part for me is biopsychosocial growth and development. So I try to simplify it by saying it's the way that our unique body, mind, emotions and spirit help to shape who we are and how we're in relationships. I'm going to make that even more concrete for you. So how our bodies influence who we are and how we relate. I'm going to use myself as, as an example tonight just because I know me pretty well and I don't know you. Um, so the fact that I am a short, roundish, fairly hairy man Sorry, that's not a line. <laughs> um, impacts how I see myself as a man. And impacts how I put myself in the world as a man and how other people see me. So my physicality is part of my sexuality. My sexual experiences don't just come from the parts of my body that are, you know, down there. But come from all the parts of my body. And your physicality, your, your height, your weight, your body type, your reproductive capabilities, your physical response to becoming turned on, all of those things influence the way you see yourself and the way you put yourself in the world and the way people respond to you. So that's what we mean by sexuality. Our emotional sides, the fact that I am a sort of sensitive, emotional guy, influence the way I see myself as a guy, influence the way I put myself in the world. Same thing with our intellect, with our spirit. So we can't not be sexual people. We're sexual every moment of our lives. And we're sexual from birth to death because we come into this world with bodies and brains and emotional capability. And from that early moment, actually, you know, we know that in the womb, <coughs> We are forming relationships, right? Little kids are going up to that big belly and saying, hi, baby, and, and talking to the baby and putting their, putting their cheek against it and rubbing it and saying, I can't wait till you get here. So we, it's, it's every moment from when we're born to when we die. And if we see sexuality in that expanded kind of way, I think it becomes easier for us to talk about sexuality. Because we're not just talking about things getting hard or things getting wet or inserting tab A into slot B and, and things like that. We're, we're really talking about a much bigger way to be human. To be sexual is to be human. If you weren't sexual, you wouldn't be a human. Think about it that way. And our kids are human from way little to teenagers to, to way big. And we are as well. So let's try to work on expanding our idea of sexuality to incorporate those ideas. Given that, what do we mean by healthy sexuality? Well, this is, again, a, a little bit of a vague definition, but I'll make it more concrete. So healthy sexuality, if we have these bodies, these intellects, these emotions, then healthy sexuality is having age and stage appropriate body stuff, and emotional and intellectual stuff, and relationship stuff. A sexually healthy person has good knowledge of their body, the way it works, has an appreciation of their body, where they are, at that point in their lives. A person with healthy sexuality is engaging in relationships, not necessarily that are sexually active, but they're, they're sexual relationships, because they all are, in ways that are appropriate to their emotional development, their emotional capacity. 
And that's influencing the kind of relationships that we're having. So this hopefully is beginning to come a little more into focus. And let's get even more specific. So healthy sexuality basically means the right things are happening at the right time. We know, and Eric Erickson was right, we know that one of the first developmental tasks that we have as human beings is establishing a basic sense of trust in the world. That whole trust versus mistrust is Erickson's first, first step. And we know that infants who do not have the opportunity to bond and create that basic sense of trust in the universe have very difficult times forming healthy relationships when they are older. Because the right thing didn't happen at the right time. It's right for infants to have that bonding experience. You know, toilet training, we don't think of that as part of our healthy sexuality. It's incredibly important. Toilet training is all about learning to recognize body sort of urges and responses and learning some sense of control about them. Well, isn't that a very transferable skill to feeling really turned on and feeling my body respond sexually and figuring out what kind of control I have over that? And I, you know, I don't just like stop and poop at any minute. <laughs> Because thankfully, right? I mean, it's one of the things that like separates us from some other non-human animals is that other people just stop and poop. But we actually say, oh, wait, okay, I should not do that right now. I should go somewhere. Well, that skill, that, that, that element of developing body awareness and control is a great transferable skill later on in life about feeling and responding to other kinds of body feelings. Children's curiosity about bodies. People sometimes get very freaked out when little kids like to look and like to share and I'll show you yours if you show me mine and things like that. And it's very natural. Um, and one of the things that actually can be difficult because we live in this, America is such an interesting place when it comes to sexuality. We have this real sort of bipolar view about it. Everything is sexualized. But we have those puritanical roots that we came from that say, no, 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 pure, nice, good people. And, and it's very hard to, to figure out how they work together. And so it, it's difficult. So a lot of times we say to kids, you know, no, you can't, you, know, you can't show your vulva to your class. It's not really, I mean, I know you want to, I know they want to see it, but really no. I mean, it's, but it's really okay for you to be curious about what vulvas look like and how they look different than penises and things like that. So again, it's about, it's about what's the right response to a very natural feeling and relationship. And independence and vulnerability for young people. I mean, a lot of people say to me, isn't it terrible that teenagers feel invulnerable. I think it's really necessary that teenagers feel invulnerable at some part in their development. Because how are we ever, how do we ever learn to leave this safety and security, hopefully, of our, of our home world, our little nest, I'm like, okay, go out on your own there and do something in the world. It's a lot easier if you feel powerful and invulnerable to do that than if you feel really scared. One of the, my parents, God rest their soul, my parents were good people. It's, it may not sound like that once we're through tonight, but they really tried hard. And, um, and, but the, the very first thing my parents taught me to do was worry. They basically said, worry about everything. And then you'll be okay. And that wasn't true. Um, so, you know, feeling invulnerable, I, I never felt invulnerable. I felt vulnerable constantly. <laughs> constantly. And that made it really tough to be a teenager. And to figure out, like, going out into the world and trying new things, you know? Um, and it can make it tough as an adult to do that. So healthy sexuality, right things at the right time. 
Conversely, unhealthy sexuality, well, a couple of ways that can develop. One is when that right thing doesn't happen at that right time, right? So infants don't learn to bond. But another thing is when the wrong thing happens at the wrong time. So, for example, uh, childhood sexual abuse, which, which can very much be the wrong thing at the wrong time, right? It's an inappropriate level of, of sexual activity and relationship and power um, at a time when kids really can't process that. It's the wrong thing at the wrong time. It's really unhealthy. We know that kids do an amazing job of healing from childhood sexual abuse very often. Um, but there's no doubt that it's better if that's not there. Other wrong things at the wrong time can be an unwanted teen pregnancy. It, bodies are perfectly capable at that point of becoming pregnant. But in terms of both the emotional, the social, the relational pieces of that, sometimes that can be in place and that can work. Sometimes that's the wrong thing at the wrong time. Other things that can get in the way, the wrong thing at the wrong time, things like um, loss of intimacy in adulthood. So when we're young adults, our, one of our tasks is to sort of create intimacy, learn how to be vulnerable with people, learn how to open up. And, and so many relationships fall apart because we haven't learned those lessons or haven't practiced them enough or don't know how to do them. And that what should be happening, a real development in intimacy and a real sort of growth spurt in intimacy at that point of life, doesn't work. And it's not there. Or when we deny that our elders are still sexual people. There's really good research that shows, and this is true for babies and for seniors, that if people don't get touched, they die faster. Now, our, our seniors, our, our elders, our, our, maybe our parents, our grandparents, um, live in a society that basically says, oh, no, you're done with that. No. Sex? No. No. Ew. no. <laughs> um, but I can tell you that the sexuality education field, that's the new frontier, working with older people, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, on healthy sexuality. Don't you want to be happy, fulfilled, sexual people when you're 80? Now, maybe you're going to say, ew. No. <laughs> maybe I'll make that an I statement. I would like to be a fully functioning, happy, healthy, sexual person when I'm 80. But we deny that so much in this country of our elders. And that's really unhealthy sexuality. And then also unhealthy sexuality is when the messages that are given to us are contradicting what should be happening at that stage. So, you know, we have this media that promotes uh, sexualization of kids uh, from very early ages. Uh, and that's different than what kids should be hearing at that point about who they are or who they want to be. Uh, we have uh, gender roles that lock people into very rigid, acceptable behaviors of what are boys and what are girls. And that can really be a message that runs contrary to what some people naturally feel themselves to be. We have similar messages about orientation in our world. Uh, we have homophobia keeping uh, LGBT kids from coming out because the messages they're getting is there's something wrong about that. Uh, instead of, maybe that's okay. So there's some examples of, of unhealthy sexuality. So we, we want to start thinking about the lives of our kids and the kids that we work with and love and are close to and ask, what's the right thing for this time in their life? What do they need to know about their bodies? What should they be able to do in terms of their bodies? What about their emotional capacity? What are they ready for? What are they not ready for? How do we talk about that? And the relationships, how do those bodies and emotions, how do we use those to create relationships that really are sustaining and, and growthful and not tricky? That, those are some of the things we can think about in terms of sexuality. Okay. I'm going to switch gears for a second and talk about language. And then we're going to come back to uh, all this and put it all together. <clears throat> Any questions or comments? Are we okay? Are you with me? Good. So 
I'm talking too fast, just raise, raise your hand and I'll try to slow down. I love this one. Sit down, son. It's time we had a little man-to-man -man talk about birds. <laughs> <laughs> Just if, you, if, you, if you're comfortable answering this question by show of hands, that's great. How many um, people actually had a, a sex talk from their parents at some point in their, in their lives? Okay. Keep your hands up if it was a good sex talk. <laughs> okay, some, good, yay, yay, yay for you. Okay, some are like, yeah, <laughs> It had its moments, but <laughs> Of a B minus. <laughs> All right. One of the problems with talking about sexuality, especially to kids, is that we're not speaking the same language. And this is something that I learned. This is not my invention. I learned this a long time ago. I believe it's from uh, Janet Shelby Hyde's Understanding Sexuality, a great textbook. Is that we have to think about multiple languages when we're talking about sexuality. And I'm going to describe each of these very quickly and talk about their usefulness or not, and, uh, and how being multilingual actually can help us. So, there's slang, there's secret language, there's childhood language, romantic language, archaic language, and medical biological language. And I am not, just in case you're wondering, I am not going to say all these are bad and this is good. That's not the message, so don't, don't worry that we're going there. Or worry, because we're not going <laughs> So, slang. What is slang? Well, slang is just, you know, some people say slang is dirty words, or <coughs> slang is, is, is inappropriate language, or slang is gross talk, or potty talk. Or, but slang is really just informal and non-standard talk. It's very casual, informal way of speaking, and it's particular to a certain group. Slang is probably the most comfortable language for our kids to speak in. When I, when I give my, my students uh, those different languages and say, which is the one you're most comfortable, which is the one you use the most, slang is overwhelmingly it. For lots of reasons, I think. And I don't think that's necessarily bad. But I think there are a few things we need to know as adults about slang if we're going to speak it with kids, which often is a complete disaster. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure that really we want to aim to have our serious conversations with our kids at the level of slang. I think it's a good foot in the door moment. But I'm not sure really it conveys what we're looking for ultimately. Um, and slang is tough because you have to know, I mean, the reason why your kids laugh at you, the reason, let me, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, they don't laugh at you. <laughs> the reason why my students laugh at me when I try to use slang is because I clearly don't know. Because it's, it's different. It differs from time to place to culture. Now, I'll give you a, an example. When I, I grew up in, uh, in Philadelphia. I grew up in a, a part of the city called South Philadelphia. It's where Rocky comes from. <laughs> That's like the cultural reference most people get about Philadelphia. Look at this in front of the gorgeous Philadelphia Museum of Art, which is one of the most incredible collections in the whole world of fine art. There's the Rocky statue. <laughs> Do you know that people line up around the block to take their picture in front of the Rocky statue? <laughs> when two feet that way is the Philadelphia Museum of Art. <laughs> Anyway, that's where I'm from. <laughs> so when I was growing up in the 1970s um, in South Philly, if, if I was having a conversation with my friends and somebody said, did you date? Did you date her? To date didn't actually mean to go out and spend an evening or go to a Phillies game. It meant that you French kissed them. So did you date somebody? That meant that you French kissed them. Now, for my friends in the Northeast, that's not what it meant. It meant something different. It meant actually go out on a date. So if you didn't know that, if you were in South Philly and you didn't know that, then you'd have a hard time understanding and using that word. Okay. So there's a, there's a quick example of slang being, being regional and cultural. Uh, by the way, in South Philly, if you went out on a date, you went out with somebody. 
So did you go out with them? Yeah. Did you date them? Yeah. <laughs> There's two different things. Yes. So what do you think about asking your kids uh -huh. about the slang you hear them using? I think it's a great thing to do. I think it's often met with a fairly defensive reaction. Uh, partly because they feel protective of it. Partly because they think like, I never want to hear those words out of my mother's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> because I would just die. <laughs> um, I think what I have found to be more effective is rather than say, what do you mean by that? Is what do kids mean when they say hook up? You know? And by the way, hook up is a great example of slang. That means a huge variety of things. <laughs> I mean, hook up, you know, our, our young folks, and they're, they're laughing because you know. Hook up can mean anything from like, I went out on a date to I made out, whatever that means, with somebody, to I had sexual intercourse with somebody. And it can mean that depending upon different places and times and situations. So slang can really be confusing. And I think that's part of the problem with it as a language, is that even when we're all speaking slang, we're not speaking the same language. Secret language. This is really good. Uh, you know, secret is simply something you intentionally are keeping from somebody else for some reason. And secret language comes in three flavors. There's intentional secret language. Every generation of kids invents language so they can talk about sex without grown-ups knowing what they're talking about. And many times, they succeed. And we have no idea that that cute little thing they're saying means if we knew what it meant. So, yeah. So every generation invents. Uh, I don't know if, if, if any of you are, are of the age or, or if kids are still using big middle school language is pen 15. You know this one? Oh, yeah. Come on. This is secret language. You're in the pen 15 club. It means penis. It's a way middle schoolers can write and talk about penises without having to say the word. Oh, pen 15, yeah, pen 15. <laughs> and we're like, pen 15? Secret language. Kids created it so they could talk with each other and have a shared understanding without us knowing. Um, other kinds of secret language. Uh, uh, in our school for a while, uh, kids invented a new word for penis. Uh, they were calling it a gat, G-A-T. And that came from a Gatling gun. Now, we're a Quaker school. <laughs> Quakers are the big non-violent, you know. Yeah. So, so GAT was not really a good thing to be going around our school, but it was part of the language the kids developed to talk about. The, okay, I'm, this, I'm gonna share this even though it makes me look like an idiot. Um, and I'm not most of the time. But, uh, there was a year, I don't think this was your senior class, there was a year, every year the senior class gets t-shirts, you know, it's a big deal, very fun, we're a small school. Um, and they put a little slogan on it, you know, it's about their graduation year, something fun. Well, one year, the senior class's slogan for their t-shirts was, got knowledge? It was around the got milk era, you know, and we were like, Oh, that's so great. Wow, we love that. Got knowledge, so cool. You know what it meant? Oral sex, got head is what it meant. And all the faculty like, oh, I want a shirt. Oh, I want a shirt. Such a great idea. We put it in the yearbook. Got knowledge. And no kid broke that code. No, until years later, I was having coffee with a with a graduate, and I was like, "Oh, yeah, it was so fun, you know, so great." And he was like, "Dude," <laughs> and he, he said, "You didn't know?" I was like, "No, I didn't know." So it can really be intentional. It can be good. Um, tip, tip drill was one that was going around for a while. Tip drill is a uh, is putting just the head of the penis, inserting just the head of the penis into whatever orifice you're inserting into. 
as a, as a form of sex, which for some reason some kids for a while thought was safer than putting the whole thing in. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were tip drilling, that's what you were doing. Right. Secret language also, though, can be used, and this is, this is more, uh, this is sort of sadder, can be used to cover discomfort. And this is very often the way that parents and kids communicate with secret language. And it's really about missed opportunities. Um, the, the, the number of young women who come into my class in a fairly well-to-do suburb of Philadelphia who do not know the proper name for their own genitals is amazing. The number of adult women I have met who do not know that that thing is called a vulva and not a vagina is stunning. Because so many girls early in their life had conversations like this from their mom or dad. Someday, someone may want to touch you down there. And you should be protective of down there. Because down there is a very private and personal spot. And someday you may want someone to touch you down there. But I don't think people should touch you now, down there. <laughs> Far. <laughs> my, my own mom, my, my sainted mother, may she rest in peace, when she, my, my mom was a woman who um, a second generation Italian immigrant, did not finish high school. Um, but my mom, and my mom had two boys. And she wanted to give us the sex talk. And I, I give her a lot of credit for that. And my mom went to the bookmobile, because we didn't have a library, and got out the sex books. And sat me down when I was about 14, if I remember correctly. It was in the summer. And she opened the books. And she said, I want to talk to you today about the marriage act. The Marriage Act is a very special thing that happens between a man and a woman when they love each other. Now you're at the age where the Marriage Act may become of interest to you. And you should know that it's called the Marriage Act for a reason, because it really should be in a marriage, because it's the Marriage Act. And it's a beautiful thing. It's not shameful and it's not dirty. It's a really lovely thing. But I just want you to know that that I, I want you to remember that, that the Marriage Act is for marriage. She said, do you understand? And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was, I was 14. I knew what sexual intercourse was. I even knew a lot of the slang words for it. I had no idea what she was talking about, <laughs> none whatsoever. And here was my mom trying to do the right thing, right? She was trying to really talk to me about her values about intercourse and trying to let me know that my interest in intercourse was okay for where I was, but because she could only speak in secret language, because she was so uncomfortable, we missed an opportunity. And it was a really good opportunity. And you know what might have happened if we were able to have a better connection with our language? If she used language that I understood, and if I felt more comfortable to say, I don't know what you're talking about, Mom. You know, so secret language, sometimes that discomfort is really, really difficult. Because it really robs us of what otherwise could be a good opportunity. Um, one of my favorite secret languages comes from the South. In the South, uh, they refer to a woman's period as falling off the roof. <laughs> so little girls fall off the roof. That means they get their first period. So Sally fell off the roof. Did she get hurt? No, we sort of knew she was going <laughs> to. And there's all those other ones for period, right? Like a visit from Aunt Flo, or a visit from Auntie, or, you know, the curse, or, the, or I, my little friend, or, you know, all this language, because we don't want to talk about the fact that, as one of my ninth graders came into class yesterday and announced, my uterus is shedding. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Some other girl, that girl said, no, it's not. And she said, yeah, I have my period. She said, that's not what a period is. So we had a whole discussion about what a period was. And some boy said, your uterus is falling out? <laughs> so it's not always 
Let's do a lot of work. It's not managing of work. Right. Lastly, secret language can be unintentional, and that's when it's jargon. And, uh, and I've been guilty of this. I spent, in between my two teaching jobs, I spent four years uh, working for an aid service organization in Philadelphia. I was their volunteer coordinator and their trainer. And I did lots of HIV education out in the community. And I would go to schools and I would talk about dental dams and safer sex and using condoms and stuff like that. And after one of my presentations, a young man came up to me and he said, that was great, I learned a lot, it was really cool. He said, you were talking about, and my whole thing was on safer sex. He said, I just have a question. I don't know what you mean when you say safer sex. Duh. I knew what I meant. I assumed they knew what I meant. I never defined it. So I was speaking secret language to this kid. Dental dam. Nobody had a clue what I was talking about. So I was speaking secret language unintentionally. I was using jargon. And again, we missed an opportunity. So secret language can be really funny, but it can also be a little, a little tough. Um, we have childhood language. And this is that language that often is talked about as protecting the innocence of children, although I really think it's about covering the discomfort of adults. Because three-year-olds who can say penis out loud make some people nervous, <laughs> let alone vulva. So think about the first word you learned for your genitals when you were a kid. Now today, I can say that more and more kids actually learn penis and vulva as the, name, as the first words they hear for their genitals. It's not the words I heard. It may not be the words you heard. I heard that little boys had birdies, <laughs> and that little girls had rosebuds. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? <laughs> rosebuds. It's, it's nice. It's pretty. Yeah. Um, but those are the words I learned. And it was because, you know, my mom couldn't envision that it would be healthy for a little kid to know a word like penis and to say a word out loud like penis. But what we do is we tell kids that this is your elbow and this is your eye and this is your ear and that's your knee and that's your down there. <laughs> and that's a message that they get. And it can really create some shame and some discomfort and some difficulty in why does this have a different name? I remember asking my mom about my testes when I was a kid. And I said, well, what are these? And she said, you use them later. <laughs> she never let me know when later was. I figured it out myself. <laughs> um, so, you know, and we talk about making mommies and daddies make babies, right? Mommies and daddies. And I think there's some childhood language that makes sense for, for developmentally where they are with their brains. Um, but some of it, it might just be more about us than about them. So, and I think this really has to be replaced because one of the things that I think is sad is when adult children have conversations with their parents using this language because they never replaced it. Romance language is a language I think is, is um, sorely lacking in a lot of our conversations about. Sex, sexual activity, ideally, um, we often think about it as being passionate and loving and, and commitment. But if we don't have words for that, it can be hard to convey that. So I think making sure we know words like, you know, make love, like arouse, like lover. Those are all nice words that convey that somewhat more gentle, somewhat more intimate, connective kind of language. And I often say to my students, you know, when you, if you think about the person that you're having sex with, if you're having sex with somebody currently, if you're having sexual activity with somebody, and by the way, I define sexual activity, just so you know, in my class as, um, if, if anybody besides you is involved with your genitals or anus in any way, that's sexually active for me, for my class. So I say, think about the person you're sexually active with if you're sexually active. Would you call that person your lover? And they often say no. I say, okay, so let's talk about what that means. You know, 
Um, would, you, would you say that you have passion for that person? Would you say you feel intimate with them? Not that you have to in every single act of sexual activity, but that if this is never talked about, then we're, we're really losing an important dynamic in uh, healthy sexuality. And I think love is such a confusing word for kids today because we use it for so many. I wish we had a different word uh, to use or multiple words for love because we love pizza and we love our pets and we love our partners and we love our kids and we love our iPhone. And it's very, so to say, you know, you should love somebody before you have sex with them can be a very confusing message. What does that mean? Love them like I love my iPhone? <laughs> really, I mean, love them like I love what? So that's important. There's a lot of language that's left over from earlier times, still in our language, that creeps up now and then, and it's pretty sexist, and it's pretty homophobic, and it's pretty nasty and sex negative. Um, I love reading Victorian novels about, about, um, about sex because they have such great euphemisms, you know. He deflowered her. <laughs> yeah. He defiled her. And the one that makes my teeth hurt, she performed her wifely duties. Those are all euphemisms for sexual intercourse that you may still hear. Even a word like wedlock. Who the hell wants to be in wedlock? <laughs> That does not sound like anything I really want to be a part of. It's an old word. Um, maidenhead, a word for hymen that, that exists in some circles still. You know, so we want to be careful of those words and challenge them when we see them. Any language, of course, that's sexist or that's homophobic, we want to challenge. Lastly is the medical and biological language. And this is, this is a good standard language for educational purposes. It's a good language for more formal discussions. You have to know this language before you use it. I told you my mom sex talk story. Here's my dad's. My dad is also a second generation uh, Italian immigrant. My dad is also was a blue collar guy, carpenter all his life. And when I was, I think I was 16, he brought me into my parents' bedroom, which was big because that was not somewhere we went. And he sat me down. I was trying to do this without laughing, but I'm not sure I can. And he said, I want to I wanna talk to you about something. Okay, Pop. He said, I want to talk to you about mastication. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, you're at an age now where uh, mastication becomes uh, probably something you're interested in. And a lot of guys your age masticate. I don't want to say they don't. <laughs> and I, and I, I, you know, I masticated when I was your age, too. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not, nothing wrong with it. It's not going to hurt you. But you don't want to do it too much. Okay? Now, I was sitting on my parents' bed, and I was biting the inside of my eyes Because I did not want to laugh at my pop, who was really trying hard to convey a message to me. You know? But my dad didn't know that he was telling me about chewing. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell him. So I just let him say masticate over. <laughs> but he tried, and I'm, you know, I give him, I give him a lot of props for trying, because he really wanted to do it. He wanted to, he wanted to say something to me that he thought was important, and he wanted to convey a value. Um, you know, again, I talked about vulva and, and how, how misused a word that can be, how people don't, don't know that language before you use it. And sometimes people think, it's so funny, people think, you know, all these slang words are okay, but penis is a dirty word. So we have to de-shame some of this language. It, you know, it would be great if we could all say penis without getting it, pardon the phrase, stuck in our throat. <laughs> substitute teacher had a had a substitute in a sex ed class and she knew she had to say penis and she couldn't do it and so she stood in front of the mirror and she said 
happiness. <laughs> happiness. 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 <laughs> she worked herself up to be able to say it. And if we have to do that, we have to do that. <laughs> so, I don't think any of these languages is wrong all of the time. I think they all have their uses, and I think the more multilingual we can be, and the more we can talk to kids about being multilingual, can really be helpful. I say to my students, just think about how it would look if, you know, what if you had a symptom that you were worried about? And what if you went to the doctor, you know, and if the best you can muster is, I have a rash on my dick. That's, I mean, that's great, because you can actually go that far. Good for you. But, how much better would it be in that situation if you could say, there's a rash on my penis? You might get a slightly different reaction. And it's, and, you know, so that's a, or, you know, to, so to be able to vocalize these words in the right situations really makes sense. So being multilingual, that's what we want to do. That's our goal. All right. Let's transition to talk about some really concrete core things we can do to talk. And then I want to open it up to questions and discussion. We interrupt this program for a family discussion about sex. I wish that would happen in every house. I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm sad that it doesn't happen as much. Because often, quite frankly, this is what's doing the sexuality educating. And that's what's doing the sexuality educating. And not these good people who are not going to say mastication or <laughs> marriage act. So, so what do you do? How do you make this work? I think the first and most important thing is to clearly articulate your family's values regarding sexuality, especially when your kids are teenagers. A lot of the research says that kids do want to know what we think. They don't want to ask us what we think, but they want to know what we think are the rules. And every family has their own set of rules, values, bottom line. What's the bottom line for you? I think it's really important to share that and to share why. It doesn't mean that your kids will agree with that. But hearing that and hearing why really gives them one sense of, okay, this is a, a reason and a rationale. They're getting lots of reasons and rationales out there. Make sure your voice is one of them. Don't be afraid to say, it's actually not okay with me for you and your sweetheart to be spending the night together at this point in your life. And you're not going to do it here. You know, that's not okay. That's not part of our values. Or, I think it's really important that if you're going to be sexually active, we have a conversation about contraception. And that I, I can be involved in that decision maybe for the first time. Let's talk about why. That's a, that's a lot. I think it's really important and healthy for us to articulate that. And for little kids, same thing. It's great that you like touching your penis. That's an inside the house activity. That's not a Walmart activity. <laughs> That's a lot. Here's why. Not because there's anything bad with it, but it makes other people feel uncomfortable. And we don't like to do things that make other people uncomfortable, do we? So that's an inside, that's an inside the house behavior. You know, there's inside voices and outside voices. Touching genitals, that's an inside behavior. That's another way to make a rule. Secondly, uh, talk to them, no matter what their age, about what you think is appropriate for them. And the short version of this is for every no, give them a yes. Because if all they hear is no, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, think about this. If, we, if kids grow up with messages that say, be careful around sex, it's really dangerous, you could die, <laughs> you know, really will screw you up, now go out there and form a healthy relationship. <laughs> How do you do that? So wouldn't it be helpful to hear from us 
what we do think would be really great. So, and I think, it, I think it's really, you know, if, if, you're, if part of your values is, you know, I, it's really not okay with me if you're having sexual intercourse at this point in your life. What is it okay with you if they're doing it? Hopefully it's a little more than like being locked in your room until you're 45. But is making out okay? What does that mean for you? Tell them that. Is masturbation okay? If it is, tell them that. What, what feels appropriate for you? Because they often don't know those lines. And the lines they're getting again from outside can be very confusing. So you helping to sort of say, here's what I'm imagining would be going on. Here's, here's what I would feel good about if I knew. Because, I mean, we do want them to be happy and healthy and well-adjusted and, and appropriately physical and all that. So let's tell them what that looks like for us. That can be very helpful. Thirdly, it's really hard to give a message that just says, if you're going to have sex, make sure it's safer sex, where there's a skill involved or a decision involved without talking about how you make that decision or how you actualize that skill. So use a condom is actually not a great message. Because how do you do that? Do I like put it on my head? Do I sort of blow on it and throw it out the window? Like what, what does that mean, use a condom? Okay, I, I'm pretty sure I put it on a penis. But when? And how? And how many? If I were six, is that better than one? <laughs> no. The only place you double bag is in the supermarket. <laughs> because the friction will rip them. So, so if we're talking about decisions, you know, I want you to make good decisions. What does that mean? What is, how do you make a good decision? How did you? This is a good time for you to share some stories about your lives about decisions that you made, successfully and not so successfully, quite honestly. How did you figure out? You know, one of the questions that kids really want to ask and they're afraid to is, how did you know when you were in love? And, and there, is, there is this element about being in love that involves some kind of decision, some kind of assent, <coughs> commitment. Talking about how you figured that out could be very helpful. And talking about how you screwed that up. You know, what did you do? How did you manage your first broken heart? That can be a really great conversation. Because there's skills involved. I talked to people. I wrote in my journal. I cried a lot. You know? I had a kid in school just right before break who um, his girlfriend broke up with him. And they, they, were, they, were, they both go to our school, so they were one of our you know, couples who was out there. And he was just devastated. He was so sad. He just, he just wanted to hug him. And he said, what do I do? And I said, you feel bad. You cry. And you don't let people tell you it'll be OK, because you don't believe that now. And you say, this is going to be crappy for a while. And it's going to be hard to focus on your schoolwork. And that's OK. And what you might need to do right now is just like feel it, and then you can let it go. But you got to feel it first. And he was like, oh. because nobody told him it was okay to feel bad. But that was part of it, you know. Four. There's a lot of research out there now about the prefrontal cortex, right? This place in our brain that makes decisions and that it's not fully formed until we're 25 or so. And so, you know, all these teenagers are out there with defective merchandise, right? You know? But I think what's important as a counter to that message is to let them know that you think they can make a good decision, that you have confidence in them, that they are able actually to do things besides just screw up. Because they have a prefrontal cortex. It's not perfect. You know, ours probably isn't perfect either at this point. But they, they do have some ability. And I think giving them some confidence to say, I really believe that you can make decisions that are healthy for you and good for you, and what those might look like, that can be helpful. 
Uh, this one, discuss contraception and safer sex options and associated values. Obviously, for our, for our teenagers, that's a really important one. For our little kids, it's just general values about safety. Right? We don't touch somebody else's blood. We wash our hands a lot. We, you know, we don't play blood brothers and blood sisters. These are like basic safety. We brush our teeth. All of these, we take a nap. All these basic safety, good, healthy things as little kids are transferable skills to sexual situations later on. So we talk about what are good options. And notice options is plural. It's really hard to give a kid one choice. One choice feels, I mean, think about it for yourself. One choice feels really hard and really limited. Two choices where I get to pick one, that actually feels a little better. I might actually do that. You know? But tell me this is the only way, and that's hard. Uh, I also would suggest that when it comes to contraception, especially with our, with our daughters, um, I don't think it's a good idea when a girl becomes you know, 15 or 16. Um, we have some families who um, automatically put girls on the pill as a way of not having the conversation. That's covered. Now we're safe. I would, I would caution that. I think it's really important to have the conversation. I don't think there's anything wrong with a 16-year-old taking the pill if, if she wants to, and that's a value for you and your family to decide. But I don't think we do that. We say, that's something we're going to do now. It's time for you to do this without a conversation involved. Uh, high risk. High risk is physical or emotional, right? Uh, stuff you're doing online, texting, emailing, what's on your Facebook, that can really, we know, can cause a lot of emotional upset. It's not just, not just physically dangerous. Because the, the, you know, we're worried about predators out there. Um, quite frankly, a lot of the predators out there are our kids' friends who are being mean to them. You know, the stranger predator, of course we need that message, you know, but it's easy to spot the guy with the trench coat saying, come here, come here, I got candy. <laughs> it's easy to do that. It's a lot harder being online when somebody IMs you and says, hey, what's up? Oh, that's my favorite song, too, because I saw it on your Facebook page or whatever. It's a lot easier to sort of figure out what's safe there. So high risk can be how much are you revealing. There's risk. Every information we put out, that involves risk. It's also physical risk. It's also emotional risk. Exploitative behavior, again, a similar message. Um, what is, where is the power thing coming into play? I get really nervous when we have 12th graders dating 9th graders in our school because there is such a huge power differential there that cannot be mitigated. There's a, there's a, a little formula out there. I don't know if you guys know this. The, the formula for how old some of you when you date them, right? You know, half your age plus seven. Half your age plus seven is the youngest age person you should be dating. This only works if you're. It doesn't work if you're like seven. It works if you're a teenager, <laughs> right? And it doesn't really matter if you're if you're ancient like me. But but when you're in those when you're in those high school years and early college years, think about half your age plus seven, because you won't get a twelfth grade ninth grade relationship with that formula. And it's I mean it's folk wisdom, but it actually has a little bit of sense to it because it's talking about. Where are the places where it's easy for a relationship to become exploitive without people necessarily meaning it to be? If only one person can drive and the other can't, that's a problem. If one person has a lot more access to money than the other, that's a problem. If one person has a bigger curfew than the other, that can be a problem. So there's, you know, where is it where somebody might be able to take advantage of you without you sort of realizing it. Of course, the other classic example today is the oral sex example. Because when we talk about teenage oral sex, we're largely talking about people giving oral sex to boys. And what are the girls getting out of that? <coughs> Maybe status. 
maybe feeling normal. But I hear a lot of girls who tell me, I don't really like it, but I have to do it. Well, yeah. Really? And when I say to them, do you ever say, uh, no, um, me first? And they're like, ew. <laughs> but this whole idea of how does, how does gender come into this and why is, you know, why is the penis prized more than the vulva? And how can that set up these relationships where there's real power dynamics? You know. And in my, in my sassier moments, I'll get the camera roll, <laughs> I say, you know what you get to say to him next time? You put that thing near my mouth again, I'm going to bite it. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> For better or worse. They already think that vaginas have teeth, a lot of the boys. They're already afraid of them. <laughs> really? You could get stuck. <laughs> <laughs> but, there's, but there's a great example of misinformation that leads kids to make decisions around sexual activity, right? That's based on complete mythology. If you do that, you'll get stuck. Okay, then don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, sometimes you can use it. Um, this is important. Help develop responses to get out of situations. There's an amazing, amazing program in, uh, in the neighborhood where I teach, which is called Make the Call, Take the Call. And it's a, it's a consortium of, uh, of parents who have gotten together and actually made a form. And the form says, both the kid and the parent signs, it's like a little contract, and it says, if you call me, at a time when you feel unsafe, you're at a party or you're somewhere and you don't want to be there anymore, or your friends have been drinking and you're afraid to get in the car with them, if you call me, I promise I will come get you. I promise I will not yell at you. I promise I, we won't even talk about it for 24 hours. But you are guaranteed a safe ride home. I will come get you. I will be smile at you and be loving towards you and will not bug you about it for 24 hours. Then we'll talk about it. You know, it's a great concept. And it's working. It's actually working. We have kids calling their parents. So how do you get out of a situation? And this can also, by the way, uh, this unwanted sexual situations also deals with alcohol. A lot of times it's not the sex, it's the alcohol. So believe it or not, part of a safer sex lesson is if you're at a party and there's drinking and they give you a cup, you never, ever, never, ever put that cup down and pick it up again. And if you put that cup down, you get a brand new one and you make sure it's new. Or you stop drinking. Because the the, the, that's, a, that's a power control thing, right? So that can be a safe behavior, talking about some of this stuff. And lastly, please make sure you're using inclusive language so that you're recognizing that we come in all kinds of gender identities and sexual orientations. I'm not a big fan of saying to little kindergarten kids, little boys, you have a girlfriend. I like the word sweetheart. You have a sweetheart? Because sweetheart is sort of a non-sexual word, first of all. It doesn't feel like erotic. It feels sort of nice and sweet. It can be anybody. Uh, you know, moms and dads can be sweethearts. People, sweethearts are, my definition is sweethearts are people who love each other and want to make a family together. And that family doesn't have to have kids. You know, so where's that language? I think those are important. Okay, that's a lot of information. Wow. Two take home messages. One, talking about sexuality is no different than talking about anything else, no matter how much you want it to be. You can talk to your kids about anything. You can talk about sexuality. I really want to empower you about that. It's not, you don't need a degree. You just need a little courage and some will and some love for that young person. And secondly, quite frankly, it's already happened. So please jump in because it's going on. It's just a matter of whether you want to join in and be one of the voices or not. I don't mean that as a scary message. I think that's a fact. 
I think it's going on. Um, and so I think we have to realize that. Okay. I'm going to stop for a second. And I, I'd like to, we're, we're at a quarter to eight, so we're doing okay with time. I would like to uh, stop and see if, you know, are there, what are the specific questions that are out there? What are the situations? What are the things you want more information about? Or what are the things you're feeling confused about? So. I'm curious about um, what is a for sexual activity. Mm -hmm. It's very different than when I, you know, I have a 13 year old and be like, Mom, that's from the old days. Okay, so what's, what's, so what's age appropriate for a 13 year old? Well, 13, 14, okay. 15, 16. Okay, okay. I, I, I think, so I think you actually, I think you actually different. went into, t I think there's actually two, 13, 14, 15 feels different than 16, 17, 18, perhaps. There, I'll tell you, um, in terms of sexual intercourse, by the way, here's the quick data. Um, less, uh, about three quarters, uh, that's even, it's even higher than that. It's 80 something percent of kids have not had sexual intercourse by the time they're 15. But over 70% of kids have had sexual intercourse by the time they're 17. And here's the magic time. It's the summer between junior and senior year of high school. <laughs> Honest to God. And it corresponds with two things. Getting a driver's license, and it corresponds with thinking about college. Um, because the driver's license gives lots of access to freedom, lots of access to going places where you're not there. Um, and a lot of kids really do think about and wrestle with the question of, do I want to be a virgin when I go to college? And maybe I just want to sort of, this is the word they use, get it over with before. Because it's too much pressure to go to college and start life over again and be a virgin, for some kids, depending upon what that means. So there's, okay. But let's go back to your question, 13, 14. Well, I mean, 13, 14, we know that kids are well into puberty at that point, puberty starting earlier and earlier. There are different ranges. Some of the boys are you know, barely spouting, spouting pubic hair at that point. Some of the girls have been having periods for years. So they're fertile. They're certainly getting turned on. One of the things puberty is good for is raging hormones. And that, that means they get turned on really easily. They're very interested in all things sexual. Um, for If you're asking sort of me personally, 13, 14 year olds, I, you know, I think masturbation can be a really good, healthy way to learn about your body, way to learn about pleasure, way to learn about um, what you might want in a partnered relationship. I think in terms of partnered relationships, um, I certainly think that kissing and French kissing and sort of making out feels appropriate, again, according to my values from where I'm looking at. Um, I don't want 13, 14 year olds having sexual intercourse. I get nervous about 13, 14 year olds having oral sex, to be honest. Uh, what about touching? You know, it's, I think that there, I think mutual masturbation can actually be a good alternative to other partnered sexual activity. Imagine the conversations all that entails to be talking about that, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if you're asking, you know, if you're, because I don't, you know, while their bodies are ready at 13 or 14, not sure they have the emotional capacity to handle some of the, the hurt stuff that can happen. Not sure their, you know, their, their bodies are also pretty fragile. They're, they're pretty susceptible to STIs. And, and we know that teen bodies, when they're still going through puberty, um, when they get STIs, I mean, obviously they're, they're the ones that are curable are curable no matter when, but, but I worry about um, early STI infection and potential impacts of that. Because one of the things we know is that uh, when you get an STI, it makes it easier to get an STI later in your life. Um, so so those, are some, those are some things I, I think about. I also think about, for a 13, 14 year old, Again, this is my line. What are you comfortable talking to your partner, your sweetie, about? Because if you can't talk to them about it, I don't think you should do it with them. 
I don't know a lot of 13-year-olds who can have a good conversation about sexual intercourse with their sweeties. Some can. I don't think a lot of them can. So I, that's part of what I let that be my I think a 16-year-old might be able to. And maybe has. So there, you know, I'm, I'm, those, that, that's where I would put a line. But again, I think it really comes down to your family values. One of the yeah. problems is the school Please. community is so much bigger than yeah. mom. Mm -hmm. And I was reminded of this when my 12-year-old, um, father in eighth grade, um, was sent as part of her phys ed assignment to Rite Aid to compare condom brands and mm. prices. And um, you know, all I could do sort of was be shocked with that and, and mm -hmm. uh, say, you know, I wish I had known this was coming up. <laughs> Um, right. And it gave us an opportunity to have the talk, which is part of the point, mm -hmm. but uh, to right. have sex exactly. Uh -huh. exactly. Well, did you find a best buy? Yeah, I was going to say, do you know what, what they were actually being asked to compare? Yeah, or went, you know, they went in groups with their peers mm -hmm. and, you know, had to report back as part of the class. Mm -hmm. There's, let me just address that for just a, just a minute, and I, I see your hand. Um, you know, one of the things that, certainly with my high school kids, we have condom day, and we do a couple different things. One is first, I give out just the boxes, and we actually look at the boxes and look at the various marketing techniques, and look at the names, and look at the colors, and that kind of stuff. I think there's a lot of good informed consumer education that can happen there. I also think, you know what? Having the experience of walking into a CVS and going up to the condom case and taking one off the shelf is not a terrible skill. Because mm -hmm. boy, do I want them to be able to really do that. Um, part of what, you know, again, the whole use a condom, right? So maybe it's not about how to put it on, maybe it's how to get it. Um, I know a lot of kids who can't imagine doing that. So I, I, I'm actually agreeing with you that I that I'm not sure I, I'm not sure what the what the objectives were there, um, and I'm you know, 12 year olds. Depending upon the context of that, I'd be much more be much happier if the teacher was there as they went in and. Did this? I took them in, in or groups as you or whatever. Said, you know, yeah. do it in school, right. But. right. but I also think that that's a really good place to say, here's where our here's where our values are really different, and here's why. Right. Because you can only control yours. So I wonder if you care to comment about another kind of form of language, sure. which I guess would be I see in boys, you know, fourteen year old sign language develop, um, especially amongst boys, but also body language yeah. and the language that comes from um, the way adolescents dress. And what messages as parents we should take from that? Yeah. Or if we should inter when we should intervene if we That's a that's a great question. So it's a different language. Thanks. Yeah it is. Language. The non the nonverbal language is, is is really key. Um, the the Dress language, I think in terms of the way kids are dressing, I think it's I think that's a really important conversation to have. And I think it's really important to I don't think there's anything wrong with saying to a boy, um, so you want people to see your underwear? Tell me what's that about? Why? Just tell me, I mean just like because clearly we can see your underwear. <laughs> So, so what's that about? And they're like, well, it's cool. Okay, so why is it cool for me to be able to see your underwear? Well, you just don't, no, no I, I want to get it. I really want to get it. So, or, you know, for some of our girls, okay, so you're aware that that outfit is like, like when I'm looking at you and I'm your parent, I'm totally looking at your chest. Like that outfit is totally bringing my attention there. Is that your intention? Okay, why? What's that, what's that about? Because I often think that we don't challenge kids enough to really think that through. Like, wow, people are actually looking at my chest? And then maybe I want that. Maybe because I'm proud of my chest and it makes me feel good. All right, that's a conversation. But, so, so the, I mean, it is a conversation. So the, so I think the dress thing, the dressing is hard. It's really hard because often I hear, you know, parents say, and I, I, again, I'm not a parent, but I believe this. It's hard to buy something for my kid that doesn't have, you know, sexy written across the bottom, or, 
you know, things that are that I, that the style of dress that I would like to dress my kid in. Okay. Um, so I think that I think the dress thing has to be a conversation, and I think it really has to be a, a what are you going for kind of conversation. If if you can if if that can happen, and I think again it has to come to the level of not like oh my god you kids are so you and your weird clothes, but like I I'm I'm really trying to understand. Like I want to be I don't know if it's I don't know if it's wrong for, I mean, I, I have feelings about seeing your underwear, but I want to know what you're, what it's about, you know? Um, the other, the other nonverbal stuff, um, I totally think we have to call kids on it when we see it, because a lot of the nonverbal stuff, it becomes reflexive in the same way where if you want to stop saying um when you talk, you have to start recognizing that you say um when you talk. And you have to know what triggers you to say um when you talk, and then you can be aware, and then you can. Same thing with the nonverbal stuff. Do you realize what you just did? Do you realize the way when you and your friends get together? This is what I saw when you and your friends got together. Again, what's that about? Just the way we say hi. Well, what does it mean? Okay. Well, is that what you want? So again, it's really about what are you going for? Now, if we're going for a sensation, if we're going for, you know, rebellion, if we're going for, well, then you know that. And then you can also put your foot down and say, no, you're allowed to say no, um, if there's, you know, if it really violates your values. Um, but I think it's about awareness, and it's about really challenging them and their rationale. Because they have one. And if they don't have one, they need to get one. I mean, it's like you, you start this conversation and all of a sudden you feel like you're the most uncool parent in the world saying, oh, oh you know, or what, no, you they know what I'm so, saying? No, they so want you to care. They but do. when they give you that, yeah. hey, mom, yeah. you know, I'm too cool for Well, that, that's their job. Their job is like, hey, mom, their job is to, is to sort of roadblock it. But here's the deal. Even when they roadblock it, they hear it. So you gotta keep saying it, even when they when they roadblock it. And you also sometimes I find it's helpful to not ask about this kid, but their friends. Why why is it that I see guys doing this? Why is it that you know I was I was picking you up yesterday, I saw this bunch of girls and they were or a bunch of girls were wearing What's, what's that about? Because sometimes when it's not about them, they're more willing, they love talking about their friends. They're more willing to talk about their friends. So sometimes that's actually a good in, and then you can ask the question, do you, do you agree with that? Is that what you think? Because you know? I think it, it, their defenses naturally go up when they think we're coming at them. Um, so don't come at them directly. Or, if you want to have the conversation and you really, you really think it's important to have it, put them in the car and go for a very long ride. <laughs> Honest to God. And turn off the radio and take their iPod away and, and just drive around <laughs> until you finish. Because then also they, when, when, when their friends say what happened last night, they get to say, Oh my God! You'll never believe what my father did. Like I couldn't get out of the car. I was like trying to get out of the car, and they just kept driving around, driving around. Because so they actually heard it, but they also get to save face with their friends a little bit, and that's important to them. Strategy. <laughs> um, what do you think about siblings teaching? Do you think it's just kind of a parent thing, or? Oh no! Parents? I think siblings are such good resources. And such good models. And I think, you know, sometimes people say, well, I have kids, I have an 18-year-old and a 13-year-old, and I'm afraid that the 13-year-old is seeing what the 18-year-old is doing. And I don't know that that's a problem, because I think there's a great conversation of why the 18-year-old is here <coughs> and why the 13-year-old is here. And I think it's really great if the 18-year-old can say to the 13-year-old, you know, when I was your age, here's what I was 
feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Siblings are great. Because siblings are totally protective of their little siblings. They really, they want them to be cool, but they don't want them to get hurt. So enlisting them is really a great idea. Thanks for that. Um, I have an interesting dynamic because um, I have 12 year old triplets, um, two boys and a girl, and my daughter is way ahead um, as far as just um, maturity wise. Mm -hmm. And then I have one who was just telling her a funny story. He must have said penis like five times in 10 minutes on the table the other night. And then my other son is much more reserved and said, that's not appropriate language up there. I think that's the same. You know, so uh -huh. Then my daughter is like, do you realize you just said penis like five times? And so, but I hear all this and so I, I don't know always how to kind of, uh, I don't try to be accepting of all yeah. of how they feel. Yeah. Um, you know, I do have a little bit more, I worry a little bit more about the one that's so reserved because he's always telling the one that's, you know, says anything on top of his head, that's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. So, because, you know, I think for a 12-year-old, you know, he's way beyond his years. Yeah, 12-year-olds are, can be in really different places. Um, yeah. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the things about, I think, I wonder if one of the things about being a twin or a triplet is, you know, they, I say this not because you don't know this, but, you know, they, they really, they really are individuals and they really get to be individuals and sometimes their reactions to each other can be part of like, well, I, I don't, I don't want to be too much like him because people assume we're just one person anyway. Um, so there might be some some of that going on. So part of the conversation might be, you know, if this is who you really are, you know, good. But if you're doing this because your brother says penis five times in ten minutes, that actually, you know, might not be okay. Like, you get to really, where's your level around that? Um, I also think it's perfectly fine with two kids who are the same age to have different rules. Because they might not be in the same place, as you said, emotionally or whatnot. So it's not just about the chronological age. Because I have met 16-year-olds who are, like, so much better at handling a sexual relationship than I was when I was 22. <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, so part of it is, is, and I also think for the, for the three of them, um, having some alone time with each of them to sort of assess where where they feel like they are and where they want to be and how, what are the challenges of having two other siblings who are the same age who are right there with you so often to sort of tease out what's, what's reaction and what's naturally them? Okay. That's some of the thing I'm thinking. Yes, what are some of the ways you would assess that? I mean, what sort of words would you use? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be afraid to use a, a question like, are you, um, do you feel like you have to distinguish yourself from your brother and sister? And how do you do that? Or does it, you know, do you... Or your friends. Or your, yeah, exactly, or your friends. Or what, you know, what are the things about you that you really want to be individual? You know, where do, where do you... What do you really see about you that's different than your friends that you like? Not like, oh, my nose is too big and I'm too fat and, I, you know. But what are the things you like about yourself that are different from your friends? Um, where are the places where you find it hard to do something other than your friends want to do, even if you don't want to do it? Because so I, I, I don't think the words are all that magical. I think it's giving permission. A lot of it is giving permission to ask these questions and to look at these things and to, to consider. Because I think so often we get, you know, when I was in eighth grade and, and all the boys were around and some boy said to me, did you do it? I didn't know what do it meant, but I knew what the answer was. I knew it was, yeah. <laughs> so, but there wasn't like, it, there wasn't any permission to stop and say, excuse me, I don't know what you mean. So part of what we're doing with young people is modeling permission to ask, is modeling permission to stop and think, and is, is really modeling this sense of 
that it is a struggle. It really is a struggle to try to be an individual in a community of your friends. And where are those places where it's especially hard for you? Where are the places where, and where are the places where it's easy? So I, I, I mean, I, honestly, I think it's, I don't, I, if there were a magic phrase, I, I would tell you, I, and I would also be on Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I don't have it. Uh, there was one over here. I, wow. Okay. So let's go. One, two, three, four. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about dancing um, in terms of kids growing up dancing? Because on one level, you know, in terms of what's acceptable in school, you yeah. have this archaic form of gender role dancing yeah. is what they're going to, you know, groan through. And then they start to do more popular social dancing, and then suddenly that's okay, and there's nowhere, you know, in between. Yeah. Dancing. Wow. Um, let's go back and think about sort of ultimately what dancing is about. Really, because, because you know, dancing, dancing is a lot about courtship. It's a lot about expressing ourselves to attract attention from other people. It's, I mean, so part of, you know, dancing is too sexy. Dancing is supposed to be sexy. Dancing is about being sexy in some way. It's about sort of saying, look at me. I can move. Look at how good I am. Look at how good I look. So we, we can't, you know, we can't... That's not what dancing is about. In my day, dan no, it was not. In your day, it was the same thing. So, so okay. So that's one. Thing. The second thing is, um, you know, dancing has, in the same way that every generation invents language to talk about sex, every generation invents dancing that is sexualized in ways that make their parents kind of crazy. You know, in the 50s, Parents were nuts that kids were rocking and rolling and you know jitterbug in the twenty the jitterbugging in the twenties. The Charleston was considered overtly sexual and horrible. Um, so again, I think part of the question is, what's that you know, what's that about that dancing? And, and is do you have a distinction in your head between dance floor like what's the relationship between what you're doing on a dance floor? And what happens off a dance floor? Is that a prelude? Is that a different kind of expression? Um, I know that at our school we have we have a, several different dances, um, a lot of dances, but we have several um, sort of affinity groups that have their own dances, right? So the BSF, our Black Student Forum, has a dance every year, and our GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance, has a dance every year, and 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 you know, the Student Council has a dance, and. One of the things that's interesting is just looking culturally at some of the different ways kids dance when they're in different groups together. Right? So nobody wants to chaperone the BSF dance, the Black Student Forum dance. And, and, and I, I have to call people on this, because part of this is, obviously part of this is racism. But because there's dancing, there's a lot of like grinding and dancing that's happening that these kids feel is perfectly normal and appropriate and wonderful in the way you dance. And it makes adults really nervous. They're practically having sex on the dance floor. Well, no, they're not. Okay. They're simulating sexual moves. No, they are. That's different, though. What's that about? Why are they doing that? What's the correlation between on the dance floor? Are they, you know, if a couple is moving from the dance floor to a corner to make out, okay, there's a correlation there that we can, we can look at and we can ask about. But what often happens is a couple is like grinding all over each other on a dance floor, and then when it's over, they go this way. <laughs> and they're not really, so it doesn't seem to be a prelude to anything, except a, a, a moment of interaction together. So, um, so I think dancing is, is, by definition, there's something very tied into our sexuality about that. I think it's cultural and generational and I think that, again, we have to ask the question. We can't just assume we know what's going on with those darn kids and their dancing. We have to ask the question, what's going on with you darn kids and your dancing? <laughs> Sorry. I think you were asking. Um, I'm a family practice. I know there's another, a lot of other providers here. Thanks. And one thing that you brought up that I, I just see so many middle school girls and early high school girls um, where you know, giving oral sex yeah. I mean, is so common. I, mean, it's, 
I just wonder if you have any tips for us as providers. I mean, because we're not the parent, we're not the one setting the values there. Mm -hmm. But in terms of just just any scripting or things that might be helpful with that age, especially the middle school and high school, because it's really distressing. Yeah. The, um, the, the numbers, by the way, the, the data that we have on oral sex is actually the numbers are a little lower than than we uh, than than a lot of the media hypes up. There's there's about high school age population um, about half the kids report having had oral sex with somebody. Most of that is somebody giving oral sex to a boy. Okay, so so it's real. It's a real phenomenon. It's actually happening. It's not you know the about like lipstick parties and rubber bracelet parties where you put a bracelet on for every boy that you gave head to and that's why girls wear like, 37 bracelets up and down on that's none of that's true as far as we can tell um, really, I mean as far as we know we don't have we don't have data okay so a couple things one is um, one is I would love parents to be to, to be involved in that conversation or to have that conversation so part of it is, what do you say to a parent? Now, depending upon the doctor-patient confidentiality thing, I don't know how that comes in. But what are you know? What can a physician provide to a parent in terms of education about having that conversation? Two is, I think, really assessing again why why is it happening, and if if it's just an expectation, really challenging that. And a lot of times, the, the kids don't see the gender stuff in it. So really pointing out, like, OK, so why is it that girls are expected to do this and boys aren't expected? You know, how do boys reciprocate? I'm not saying boys should have oral sex on young girls, but, but maybe. Um, maybe that's like a Joyce and Elder. <laughs> um, but so, so so identify and then identifying not the sex part of it but the power part of it okay so do you feel powerful when you're doing it or do you not or do, do you feel sort of used and there's obviously there's more than just those two options but because part of I think the consideration that kids need to do in their heads around this is the how, how much of this what's the cost benefit analysis of it I think that's really the key with your oral sex thing so they might actually if they're getting real benefits from it then we're gonna have a hard time stopping it unless we can figure out how you might get those benefits in some other way and then it becomes a conversation not so much about oral sex. So I think actually going through the cost-benefit analysis with a kid to whatever level they can is actually a really good way to start. Because it's not actually, um, it's one step removed from the actual act of putting somebody's penis in your mouth. So that's what you're doing. But what, what don't you like about that? What do you like about that? What do you give up with that? What do you get? with that. What are the pluses or the minuses? Any of that language that works can really help them become aware and, and then become empowered to make a decision. Because I think a lot of kids don't feel like they have a lot of decision making power around that. It's just what you're supposed to do. So I think whenever we get it, it's just what you're supposed to do. What we need is education around empowerment and choice to see if we can break that. And maybe a kid will decide, I actually want to. OK, I mean, I mean, I may not like the decision, but if they're actually thinking about it and thinking their way through and saying, look, you know, and I can't really believe this is true, but if a kid said to me, this is the only way I can be accepted by my peer group, I don't believe that's true. But if, if a kid really believes that and we can't help them see another way, we're going to have a hard time because that's way bigger than it's power over me. Who cares? My friends like me. You know, and these boys like me. Or these girls like me. Can I ask how you know? Do you ask mm -hmm. kids who come into your practice? Or, you know? Yeah. 
man, that's great. I love that you asked. Yay for you. But flip it around to the boy. Yeah. So do the do what you just did, but for the boy. What's the? I don't see many boys because I'm a girl. Right. right. <laughs> I think it's a great conversation with the boys. How do you talk to boys about it? And say, oh, well, what's the cost benefit? I mean, yeah, I mean, same thing, right? What's the cost benefit analysis of this? If you really like this girl, then, I mean, think about like literally the positioning that she's on her knees in front of you. Is, like, really? That is that is that the dynamic you want in your relationship? If so, and what, all right, so you're getting some pleasure out of this, and you're feeling studly and like a guy, but what, what do you want her? You know, would you still do it if you knew she didn't like it? Would you still want it? And if you say yes, what's that about? Well, she likes it. Did you ask her? Have you talked about it? Or have you just expected it? You know? Have you tried other ways to be physical together? So there's there's a lot of great conversations with boys as well. And I think I think that it's absolutely key that we're talking to the boys. This is not just a problem for girls. This is equal opportunity here. Always. I don't remember who I said was next. You were. Yes. Um, we're talking a lot about middle school kids and yeah. early high school. And I'm wondering about these later years. You know, yeah. how late is too late? What can we do after the fact? And like what what do we have for damage? You know, what is yeah. It's never too late. Never ever. The conversation is always relevant because you can always change your mind. Having made a bad decision, let me change that language entirely. Okay. Having made a decision we regret or wish we made another one doesn't mean we're stuck with that forever. We actually can go back and rethink that. I think, And I think as we get older, you know, as we get more savvy about ourselves, as we feel more comfortable in our own skin, as we can think more what we want, what we deserve even, what kind of, you know, I think that, I think the empowerment piece becomes so much more important and so much more valuable as we're aging because we're, you know, when you're getting to be 17, eight, sorry, 18, 19, 20, 21, you're really in that stage where, Defining yourself as an individual is really such an important process. And also, developing real intimacy is really important. So I think focusing on intimacy, are you feeling like you're learning how to do that? Relationships, Robert Sternberg says relationships has three components. Passion, intimacy, and commitment. Passion is the body part. Intimacy is the sort of um, uh, uh, emotional part. Passion is the body-to-body -body part. Emotion is the heart-to-heart -heart part, and commitment is the intellectual part, the choosing, right? So when you're looking at your relationships and you're looking at those three elements, do they feel in balance? Where do you feel your weakest? Where do you feel your strongest? The way those three things manifest creates relationships that are sort of more about lust versus more about love versus more about, you know. So, um, so I think that the conversation becomes just more rich as we get older. And I, I hope that you're all having conversations with each other about some of this stuff. You know, if we're expect if you want to be good role models for your younger siblings or the or the kids coming up in this community, then practice yourself, model yourself, you know, so that you can really be supportive to, to them as well. I think that's really key. Um, I'm not sure I'm really answering your question, but I think it's all I think it all fits. Yeah. Okay, there was one more here, fine. I have an observation and a question. Please. I'm really glad you brought up the issue of power relationships, especially with the oral sex among the girls and the boys. Um, because one of the things I've noticed is we often think about books as being better than the media. And yet I'm finding with uh, some of the stuff that middle schoolers are reading, like the Twilight series, yeah. a lot of the romance novels, and even with some novels that are written for adults, I'm really surprised even if the, the narrator is a woman and the author is a woman, that when there's a, a, a scene that's described that's intimate, it's the experience of the man. Yeah. And it's really shocking to me to see that today, you know, in, in the 21st century. Um, and so, so that was just an observation. And then my question is, you've talked a lot about the importance of posing questions and sort of inviting this conversation with kids. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience with middle schoolers, both with my own and, and those I've taught, I find that, you know, if you're someone like me who's comfortable asking questions, 
um, a lot of kids find that adults and people in power or authority uh, positions to them interpret the question as implicit judgment in some yeah. way. And so yeah. there's so many, there's, it's, even the questioning stance can be fraught. Right. And so one of the f things that I find I do is I, I try to listen for opportunities yeah. so that I'm not the one initiating the conversation. Mm -hmm. But my, my difficulty with that is, you know, when you do that, when you wait for them to take the initiative and you're listening for opportunities to, to pose a question, so what do your friends, you know, like to externalize that or something, or depersonalize it? I'm just concerned about missing opportunities, and I, I wonder if you could address that. Thanks. Um, one is I think I statements are really important for, for dealing with that implicit judgment. Because when, when, they hear, when, when they hear the I statement first, it's actually, there's not an accusatory part of that. So that's important. Two is I think that the... Um, in terms of missing an opportunity, uh, you know, every song on their iPod, every TV show, every every how was school today is an opportunity. So I don't think I don't think we I don't think we can miss them. I think I think they're I think they're there a lot. Um, uh, I also think, and, and I don't know how you'll feel about this one, but one of the things that I like with kids who are a little resistant is, because the power thing, is how about if we make a deal? I'll answer a question you want to ask about me if you answer a question I want to ask about you. So I'm willing to share something that I'm willing to, to give to give up something as well. Right? So, you know, so it can all, the opportunity can also be did I ever tell you about the first time I had a sweetie? So you're actually starting to tell a story. Sure. And not just the like, did I ever tell you how, how mom and I or dad and I met? Because often that's, tell a story about when, when you were their age. You know, did I ever tell you that when I was a kid, you won't believe this, but the, the, the whatever, the dancing that we did or the music that we listened to or when I was a kid, my favorite show on TV was, and here's why. Um, those are opportunities for, for um, then invitation to say, okay, and what about, you know, what, what about yours, or doesn't that sound silly? And then you can also say, and one of the things I realize now is that I didn't know, I didn't know that that show was, you know, that show really had a lot of what, gender messages or power or something. There's, so, so part of it, I think, with, um, I think we have to be, willing and able to also share and give and put forth like almost like a goodwill gesture, you know? If we, because we are asking them really scary questions and there is a definite power dynamic. We're a grown-up and they're a kid. So how do we, and it's not like, you know, I don't want you to be friends with your kids. I, I really want you to be a parent. It would really help me as a teacher if you were a parent. <laughs> Sorry, that was a you statement. I tried to make it a nice statement. Um, so, so it's not like you know, ooh, let's like have a job party and share stories. But, but, but I do think there is something really powerful in in sharing something from your own experience, especially a point of vulnerability or a point of lesson, um, as an as an as an invitation to a question. But let's take let's take just two more, okay? And then, so I haven't spoken to you yet, and I haven't spoken to you. I'm wondering Sorry. if you and then I'll, I'll be right after if you want to come down and ask me questions. Just wondering if you could talk a little bit because of media and kids and media and all of the problems that we're having with kids yeah. and media, if we want to look at it as a problem, how you are addressing that with your students and what yeah. do you think our responsibility for addressing and making wise choices about what we put out yeah. in the world? There's a, there's a lot of media literacy that, that is essential education today. I mean, it's so different from when I was, you know, when I was a kid and we didn't have the that's such easy access. Um, so much of, of the communication I had to do as a kid was face-to-face -face or like on a piece of notebook paper that got passed to four different people, you know, to get, but I, I couldn't just text somebody. So I think a lot of it is, is media literacy stuff. I think that, um, I think watching what kids watch and listening to what they listen to and then actually 
asking them what they see in it. Because I think we often see stuff they don't, and we assume that they should see that, and they don't. Um, and I also think that uh, in terms of technology, having conversations about the difference between a conversation that takes place over a text versus face-to-face, -face, or an IM versus face-to-face, -face, I think those are really important conversations these days. I think it, conversations about um, uh, control of information and privacy, and that anything you put out in an email or in a text, you no longer have control of. And if somebody forwards that text to five different friends and you didn't want that to happen, you don't really have a lot of control over it. So public consumption, right? Anything you put out there, anybody can see. You have to sort of have that assumption. It's, this is the old, in, in the early safer sex days, we said you have to assume everybody is infected with everything because that way you can really like approach things in a way that uh, you can be, in the same way, you have to assume this text message is going to be read by everybody in the whole world including your grandmother and your best friend. <laughs> so, and you know, so you think about that. that that's a good, you know, the, this picture that you put on Facebook, you want to assume that everybody in the world can see that picture. Because all it takes is one friend of one friend, you know, to, to move that picture or tag it or post it, and you're no longer in, so how much information do you want to be in control of about yourself? How much do you want out there in the world? How much do you, and what steps, what decisions can you make around that? I think, I, I totally, I think it's a great lesson to, um, to you know, put, uh, if kids are willing to, either to put your Facebook page up on the, on the projector and talk about the information that you have, or, or what we did in, this is an English assignment, but it worked well for sexuality. We made Facebook pages for uh, literary characters for Holden Caulfield and all of his friends in The Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> and we had, we had like, the characters posting on each other's Facebook pages. So, by the way, you cannot make a Facebook account that says Holden Caulfield. It won't, it won't let you do it. So, because we tried. Um, but we actually we made real Facebook accounts for, for characters in the story. And we gave kids the passwords and had them go on. And then that led to a great lesson, not just about, you know, the characters, but, like, would somebody really say that? out loud to somebody, you know, that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of, there's a lot of creative stuff you can do as well with that. Okay. Yeah, I, I um, was wondering if you would comment on the other extreme of being unable to talk to your kids about sex. I, I do see this in my practice sometimes that parents are so involved in their children's sex lives that I'm uncomfortable with yeah. it. <laughs> and I feel pretty comfortable talking about sex. But, yeah. um, this parents hearing all the details of right. the first time, and I was wondering if you could speak to that, because I feel like there's a line there that gets crossed. In the yeah, um, I, think, I think there's definitely the line about are you, you know, what's, what's a parent versus what's a buddy or a friend. Um, I think there can be real value in a parent hearing the details of a, of a first time experience. Um, but I think it's also a matter of what are you doing with that information? You know, are you a voyeur? Like you just want to hear it. That's why you want to hear it because you want to hear it. Or is there some purpose, some education, some some lesson, some interaction that goes with it? I think that's important. So I think for parents who are really involved and maybe over involved in their kids' lives, um, a question of like why do you want to know that is an important question for them. What do you do with that? because um, that can raise some awareness for a parent, you know, and where's the line between just being a voyeur and being a, being a parent? Because part of, I imagine, that part of parenting has to be also helping them, you know, I, I can't imagine you really want, anybody really wants their kid to be completely enmeshed in their lives or the rest of their life. We want them to be some individuals at some point and free at some point. And that means you have to, there's some stuff you have to not know. Um, yeah, so I think those are some of the, some of the things I'm thinking of. Um, I'm realizing that it's, it's, it's a little after 8.30 and I want to I um, close this down. So first of all, I want to thank you so much for 
being here, for, for staying through to the end. It was really, really great to be with you. I will hang around a little bit here if you have other questions. Um, but also on the, um, on the handout is my email address. And I, I do really want to invite you, if I can be of, of help to you, if I can be a resource, please do feel free to email me, because I'll be happy to email you back. Um, that's not my full-time job, by the way, though. So I, I, may, I may need a little bit to get back to you. Um, but I would, I, would, I would really value hearing from you again. And, uh, and if, anything, you know, if anything is useful to you, please you know, take it and share it. And, uh, and thanks for being here, because being here is the first important step to having the talk. So go talk. <laughs> Thank you so much.